Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, I hope that you're all doing well and enjoying your meeting so far. My name is Omaira Ortega. I'm an associate professor at Sonoma State University, as well as the president of the National Association of Mathematicians. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing our Claytor Woodard lecturer, Dr. Shelley Jones. First, I want to tell you a little bit about the lecture itself. The Claytor Woodard Lecture was inaugurated in 1980 in honor of the second and third African Americans to earn a doctoral degree in mathematics. Dudley Weldon Woodard was the second. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a PhD in 1928. Woodard later established the master's degree program in mathematics at Howard University in 1929. And he was the thesis advisor for many of Howard's master's degree students, including William Claytor. William Claytor was the third African American to graduate with a PhD in mathematics. And he graduated, he also graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, though in 1933. Claytor would go on to become the first African American to publish research in mathematics. Each year, NAM invites a mathematical scientist or educator who exemplifies the spirit of Claytor and Woodard in their concerted efforts to advance mathematical research for underrepresented American minorities. This year's Claytor Woodard lecturer is Dr. Shelley Jones, who's to my right. Dr. Jones is a professor of mathematics education at Central Connecticut State University, and she is also the president of the Benjamin Banneker Association an organization with a mission and purpose similar to NAM. The Benjamin Banneker Association is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to mathematics education, advocacy, and establishing a presence for leadership and professional development to support teachers in leveling the playing field for mathematics, for mathematics learning of the highest quality for African American students. Dr. Shelley is renowned for the mathematics professional development that she provides both nationally and internationally, and we are very lucky to have her here today. Dr. Jones serves her community by working with various professional and community organizations, and she plays, an, she plays instrumental roles on many committees within the CBMS, the Conference Board of the Mathematical Sciences, which is an umbrella organization consisting of 19 professional societies, all of which have as one of their primary objectives the increase or diffusion of knowledge in the mathematical sciences. You can see her TEDx talk on YouTube where she talks about culturally relevant mathematics. I'm sure she's gonna share some of that with us today. She has authored many books, including The Brilliance of Black Children in Mathematics, Beyond the Numbers and Toward a New Discourse, Women Who Count, Honoring African American Women Mathematicians, and Engaging in Culturally Relevant Math Tasks, fostering hope. At Central Connecticut State University, Dr. Jones teaches undergraduate mathematics content and methods courses for pre-service teachers, as well as graduate level mathematics content curriculum and STEM courses for in-service teachers. Before joining the faculty there, Dr. Jones was a middle school mathematics teacher and a K through 12 mathematics administrator. She has been an educator for th more than 30 years. And so with no further ado, I would like us to welcome Dr. Shelley Jones. I'm gonna stand back because I wanna use this and not that. Um, so I'm happy to be here today with you to share some insights from things that I've learned in my own practice and also by working with students in-service teachers and pre-service teachers. I'd like to thank NAM for the invitation to speak today and also thank the organizers of this conference. All right, it works. So I like to start with a land acknowledgement and I'm actually gonna read this because I wanna make sure that I say the name correctly. Um, a land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples that are stewards of the land. They are the traditional stewards of the land. My statement is an expression of my gratitude and appreciation to the Mawekma Ohlone people 
of the San Francisco Bay Area whose ancestral lands we gather on today. I pay respect to their elders, both past and present. I also acknowledge that colonialism is a current and ongoing process that has impacted indigenous peoples, their traditional lands and their practices. An important goal of a land acknowledgement is to increase the support of local indigenous communities. And so I would want you to consider how you might do that in your state. So 2024 is already turning out to be a great year for mathematics. Ed Week, for the last seven years or so, uh, announces a word for the year. Can anyone guess what the word for 2024 is? Yes, you're right, it's math. <laughs> you guessed it. Well, for some of us, math brings up ideas of joy, um, puzzling, fun, but for others, it's a four-letter word. You know what I mean. Well, later in my presentation, I'm gonna talk a little about math identity and developing students' positive math identities. But before we can talk about developing students' math identities, we have to talk about teachers as well and professors, right? We have a lot to do with how students feel about themselves as mathematicians, as doers of mathematics. So before we can help our students, we have to acknowledge how our identities shape and impact what we do in the classroom, right? So I had um, a teach, uh, uh, um, an in-service teacher, and she was a grad student. And we had read some um, articles on culturally relevant teaching, and one of the articles really resonated with her by Tyrone Howard. And she said, I had never reflected on my own identity and how my identity, identities, plural, might um, impact my practice. And so I would ask you to do that same thing, is to think about who are you as a mathematician? How did you get there? And how might that impact uh, students, right, in your, in your practice. So I want to talk a little about myself. Um, well, Omida already introduced me, but I want to go even further back. So I grew up in Connecticut, and um, I also taught in Connecticut. And I think before I knew the actual theory of culturally relevant math teaching, I was doing it but I was doing it because I worked in the same town that I grew up in. And so I was always trying to empower my students to see beyond Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is where I grew up. Because in Bridgeport, Connecticut, I didn't know it until I moved away. I lived in an urban city. I didn't know what that was in an urban area. I didn't know what that was as a kid. But what I did know is there were people who looked like me. I didn't know that that was a thing. It was just who I grew up with. But when I moved away was when I started to see that, oh, you know, there are other people besides black people that, and, and Hispanic people that live in all these different places. But because that was my own experience, I was only able to see that until I moved away. And then I went to Spelman College, a historically black um, college for women in um, Atlanta. I'm sure m many of you have heard of Spelman. And that was a game changer. And the reason it was a game changer is because at Spelman, we were told that failure was not an option. It just wasn't. It was excellence for all. And if you hear that enough, that you will be excellent, guess what? You start to believe it. And so at Spelman, it was a game changer for me. Then I went on to Illinois State University where I met co my co-authors for uh, the, the Engaging Math series, and I'll talk about that in a little while. And then I, was, I became a professor at Central Connecticut State University. And at CCSU, um, I teach um, uh, undergrads and I teach grads. But something that I learned, and I didn't know about it until after, but someone actually asked me, was I was actually the first black person to earn a full professorship at Central, at CCSU, Central Connecticut State University. And I say all that to say that 
many of us don't know we're the first. A lot of times we have to either be asked or told that we're the first at something. And even in 2019, we, we are still making first. And so students need to recognize that and, and understand that and know that they could be the first at something. And then um, women who count, oh, women who count. So when I wrote women who count in 2019, that's when I actually learned about the website, Ma um, Mathematicians of the African Diaspora. And when um, Dr. Talitha Washington told me about um, a talk that she had done, well, first I asked her some things and she was like, did you see my video? Did you see my video? No, I hadn't seen your video, but I finally watched it and I, and I was like, boom. No wonder she kept asking me that because she had done a lot of the work that I um, actually ended up doing in my book. So the, the um, Women Who Count is a children's activity book honoring African-American women mathematicians. And so many, some of you are in that book and I started learning things that I didn't know before about black mathematicians. I had never learned about many of these people in any of my math classes, including somebody like Benjamin Banneker, who certainly I should have learned about. Um, and then also the other thing that I, that came to, to my ideas were, were that I asked some of the mathematicians uh, that I have highlighted in the book, all um, African-American women mathematicians, and I asked them a question. I said, what is the most difficult thing about being a black mathematician today? I'm just gonna give you two quotes. Dr. Christina Eubanks Turner replied, the most difficult thing to me is the lack of representation of mathematicians who are black. This leads to feelings of isolation and frustration that there is not enough being done to solve the issue. And so in 2019, you might feel like, well, wait a minute, you know, we have lots of programs and we do. But if this was her reply, it must be true, right? It's true for her. And so I say to you, if you have students in your classroom, students of color, even if they handle it well, and you don't know that they're frustrated or you don't know that they're feeling isolated, they might be. Because we have professionals who are still feeling that way. And so we have to think about our students as well. And then Dr. Yolanda Parker, a friend of mine, one of the co-authors of the Engaging series, she's a math teacher educator and she replied, the most difficult thing for her about being a black mathematician today is that people are still surprised that we, African-Americans, have an affinity to and can excel in math and math-related fields. And you might feel like, well, that seems like an overstatement. But remember, this is her response. This is her truth. So for her, she feels like she either feels that people don't, they're surprised. Oh, you do math? Oh, oh, is it because she was a, is a woman? Oh, is it because she's black? So these are things that you have to think about for your students. Um, oh, and I already talked about the Benjamin Banneker. I just don't want to miss anything. Um, so in uh, K-12 math, which is really my, um, my willed health, is um, for the last, I would say, maybe 10 years or so, certainly since um, the engaging book and right before that, the brilliance, um, brilliance of uh, Black Children in Mathematics book. Um, and by the way, we wrote a chapter in that book. We did not write the whole book, but we wrote a chapter in that book. Uh, but a lot of our work with culturally relevant teaching starts with Gloria Latson Billings and the work that she did back in the 90s. And when Gloria did her work, she did her work um, in a broader sense on culturally relevant teaching. So we began to ask people the question of, not a it's not a scientific survey. Whenever we would be in front of people like this, we would ask, when was the first time you experienced culturally relevant teaching, right? And you can see uh, the blues and the purples there. These are the responses. This is just 190 uh, people. So it's, it's not a scientific study, but it's just a way for us to gauge how people are feeling about this, right? And when they have ever experienced it. Because if we're asking teachers to teach in a culturally responsive way, and they've never experienced it themselves, we're asking them to do something that they don't know how to do. 
And so we have to um, assist teachers with, do, with, with understanding what it is and how to do it. But then what I realize is that, wait a minute, we need to be asking some, a more specific question. What about culturally relevant math or culturally relevant math teaching, right? So not just in a broader sense, culturally relevant teaching, right? But what about math? Because in social studies and in literacy, you can read uh, books by um, diverse uh, uh, authors and you can do all kinds of things with social studies. But when you talk about math, most people think, well, isn't math just math? It's numbers, maybe shapes, patterns. What does culture have to do with it? And so I'll talk about that. What does culture have to do with it? So when we ask about specifically math, culturally relevant math, look at, look, look at the pie chart there. 72% of the respondents, and in this case, it's only 79 people, right? It's, and usually the people who are um, answering these questions are educators. But even though it's only 70, um, 79 people, 72% of those people said, well, we've never experienced culturally relevant math, right? So I want you to take maybe a minute to, if you're close to somebody, turn and talk. If you're not, like look back and just talk about what do you notice or wonder about this, right? So just take a minute to talk about that. What does this tell you? What do you notice? What do you wonder? Okay, so normally I would do this in sort of an anonymous uh, survey, uh, Mentimeter or one of those type things, but I wasn't able to go come out of the um, PowerPoint and come back. So we're just gonna do it with a show of hands. So if you feel comfortable raising your hand, please do so. You can only answer for one. So only raise your hand for one of the uh, times when you first experience culturally relevant math. And the answers are going to be, or the choices will be, did you experience specifically culturally relevant math in elementary, secondary, secondary will include middle school and high school, uh, college or never, right? So you only have four choices. So show of hands, as a student, when was your first time experiencing culturally relevant math? If, for me, that's going back too far, I can't remember. But when was your first experience with culturally relevant math? Elementary, raise your hand. Did anyone experience it in elementary school? Okay, we have somebody in the back that did. I wanna hear about that, <laughs> all right? Because if you experience culturally relevant math in elementary school and you still remember it, it was something that was really, right, powerful for you. It was some type of powerful learning experience, I bet of why you still remember it. What about secondary, middle and high school? Did you experience culturally relevant math in middle or high school? Okay, thank you for raising your hand. And you're gonna have a chance to talk about this as well. What about high school? A culturally relevant math experience in high school? 
Hmm, what about never? As a student, okay. So it's kind of hard for us, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing for us to say, we want you to teach in a culturally responsive way, but you've never experienced it. So what I'm gonna do over the next 20 minutes or so, maybe 25, is kind of go through some examples of what we mean by cultural relevance. Um, a lot of the examples are from elementary and secondary. There, I do have um, an example for college, but I'm gonna ask you all about that. So I'm gonna challenge you to come up with some things that you wanna talk about. Um, but before I go to that, I want you to turn and talk. When we say culturally relevant math or culturally relevant math teaching, what are we even saying? So before I tell you what I think, what do you think? If you raise your hand, you must have raised it for a reason. So what does culturally relevant math mean to you? So turn and talk, and this time just maybe 30 seconds. So I'm gonna talk first about culturally relevant pedagogy in general, right? And I talked about Gloria Latson Billings and she turned to co she coined the term culturally relevant pedagogy. And the thing about her is she did some research and she went into school districts and she asked the, 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 the students, the teachers, uh, the parents, community members, administrators, who are your best teachers? I don't care how you, why you say it, but who are your best teachers? And the same names kept bubbling up. And then she went in to observe those teachers. And then what she found was that no matter if that teacher was a strict teacher or a nice teacher or a, a teacher that the kids said are fun, no matter what, every teacher that was the best teacher based on all of these different stakeholder groups, it was because they empowered their students. So students in those classes were confident, they were empowered, empowered academically because they were getting good grades, they were working hard in, in making the grade, intellectually, they were curious about things. It wasn't just about finding the answer to a problem. It was more than that. They might argue with each other, or what do we call well, discourse, right? Uh, spiritually, we talk a lot about SEL, social emotional learning. It's even being outlawed in some school districts. I don't understand why. Because students are social beings and they have emotions. We know it, especially if we teach K-12. Even our college when they come to class. You know, some, I had a student um, about a week before school ended that lost her grandmother and still came to class. Why? Because she didn't want to be by herself. She wanted to be with her classmates, right? And so we were all there for her. So spiritually and politically, we're not teaching kids who to vote for, but we are teaching them that they should vote. And we're teaching them why they should vote because we use numbers to do all kinds of things in this country and the world alike, right? We use numbers for all kinds of things, for sorting people and everything. And so in that particular case, Lassen Billings was talking about culturally relevant uh, pedagogy in general. Now, my colleagues and I, and, and um, Lou Matthews, the, he's the director of um, City Alliance, formerly Urban Teachers in uh, Washington, D.C., 
and myself, and then Yolanda Parker Johnson, that was a Freudian slip for sure. That was her maiden name when we went to school together in Illinois State, but she's Parker now. So Yolanda Parker, um, we wrote a, a series, one for elementary school and the other one for secondary. And what we said was we wanna talk specifically about math. So culturally relevant math helps students to make connections uh, to themselves, their community, and to the world. So we're helping students to actually connect to their everyday lives. And we're using math to, to, as, a, as a vehicle for them to explore these things. And it's a three-pronged approach. It sort of follows what Latson Billing says, but we, this is specific to math. So first of all, it's, um, we want to start with math that's cognitively demanding. We talk, whose session was I in um, a little earlier? Y Yvonne Lay. And she talked about rigor, right? And a lot of times in mathematics, we talk about rigor. Well, what does that mean? Well, what we mean, especially K-12 is, we want it to be cognitively demanding where students are thinking about uh, mathematics in different ways. There's different representations. There's different solution strategies. The, uh, the solution strategy is not uh, just an algorithm that they follow, right? So we want to start there. And then we want the math to be relevant. We want the context to be relevant relevant to the students, but also based on community knowledge and community inquiry. Like students, a lot of times don't know much about their own communities, but we want them to be curious about why is this thing happening in your community and how can you help? And finally, agency. So how they can help when they become confident that they can actually use math for their own selves and their people, their family, then that means they have agency, right? They're, they have confidence and also targeting empathy, meaning it's not just about you, student. It's about your community. It's about people in the world, right? So we're learning to explore inequities, not just for ourselves, but also to help others. So we created the culturally relevant, cognitively demanding math test rubric, and we use this with teachers all the time. On the emerging level, it's basically well, what we do with the rubric is we have teachers look at their current curriculum. What math problems are you doing and where do they fall? And if all the math problems are rigorous and, 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 and students are thinking, that's great. That's at the emerging level. That's where we at least want to start. But we also want things to be connected to culture and community, right? And also to student interest, but not only the student interest, because when we talk about relevance a lot of times, a, a lot of times teachers, professors will think about student interests. You know, they're interested in music, they're interested in whatever they're interested in, right? Um, and that's a start, but we can't end there. It, ha it has to be beyond student interest, it has to be beyond just the student themselves. Um, oh. The other thing is, again, we want students, we want this at the uh, developing stage, we want them to be using math to explore something and to, um, to, to really deeply think about um, some issue, right? Not just doing the math you know, for the grade or not just doing the math for that next test but we want them to deeply think about themselves and their community and the world. Exemplary. Now an exemplary um, culturally relevant task is one where there's some action involved, right? Maybe a lot of times we say social justice math or quantitative justice, math for social justice. That's what we would call an exemplary task because students are moving beyond just exploring something. It's great to explore, but what action did they take? Did they write their senators? Did they write the school board? Did they protest? You know, what action did they take? And if you don't, if you don't feel like this is uh, relevant for a math classroom, think again. Because when students come to your math classroom, they're coming with all the stuff that, that they've been hearing on social media. They come with all the stuff that they're dealing with themselves in their own lives. And if you can tap into that, then, then students won't have to say, when will I ever use this? You won't have to be so uh, worried about, you know, my students aren't engaged. These kinds of things help to engage students because they themselves are interested in that particular uh, content and context. 
when I work with um, uh, teachers in professional development, I develop a tool for them so that they can kind of think through how to revise a task that they already have. Because many times you have a curriculum, you have a syllabus, you need to make sure you hit this math, right? And so I said, okay, start with something you already have. And every single uh, task is not gonna be a culturally relevant task because it's not only about the task, it's about some other things that I'll talk about as well. But this tool is just to help them to revise a task. So first they pick a task. What task are you gonna pick? You're gonna pick a cognitively demanding task. Why are you gonna pick that? Because they're rich, they're rich in math, they're rich in thinking, it's not just an algorithm. So those kinds of tasks lend themselves to connecting other things to it, connecting real life, connecting um, other math, right? Where they can see the connections between algebra and geometry and other things. So, um, so then they write the original task and then they write the math content. And I always have them pull out, what's the math content? Because when you finish revising this task, you wanna look back at that and make sure, is it still rigorous? Is it still the math you wanna be teaching, right? So that's really important for some teachers because they feel like if I include culture, maybe I'm gonna really miss out on the math. No, we don't want you to do that. So I say, pull out the math. What is it that you want to know at the end? Am I still covering this math? And then I have them talk about what, they're, what, what strategies they're gonna use. And I'm gonna talk about that next. What strategy are you gonna use to revise this task from what you already have to a culturally relevant task? And then finally, they write the culturally relevant task, they write the uh, revised task. And then the last question, which I, I remind them all along, it's, not, it's the last question, but it's not the first time they've heard it. I say, how does this empower students? So if your task is culturally relevant, it has to empower students. And if you can't answer that question, then you need to go back and say, why am I doing this math? If it doesn't empower students, why am I doing it? And if it's just about taking a test, then okay, that's, if that's what you want, right? It has to be more, more it has to be about more than just that. So <laughs> I want you to think about what is something that you've done to empower your students? And you're gonna have a chance to talk about this in a minute, but right now, you're just gonna hold it up here. What have you done to empower your students? Because at the end, uh, once I've talked about cultural relevance, I want you to talk, turn and talk to your neighbor about a culturally relevant task that you've either done or that you've thought about since I've been talking about this, giving you examples, and that should mean that your students will be empowered. So think about that, keep it in your head, we're gonna get back to it. Okay, so back to this. Remember, the reason why we're doing this is because most teachers, most educators are telling us, I shouldn't say most, these 79 educators, right? I can't generalize, but I bet I can in some way, right? So these educators are saying that they've never experienced culturally relevant math. So these are our approaches. So in the book, Engaging in Math, Engaging in Culturally Relevant Math, we provide 12 approaches to how you can revise tasks, right? So one, uh, the first one I'm gonna talk about is uh, creating tasks from hope verbs. So you see there's 12, but I've only circled three because we're just gonna talk about three because I think these three are, are the three that most closely align to um, higher ed, right? And I think a lot of people are here are from higher ed. And if not, the examples are from K-12. So we're gonna think about it both ways. So here is the hope wheel. So during the pandemic, my colleague Lou Matthews came up with these hope verbs because during the pandemic, as you know, uh, students were at home. Sometimes they were experiencing what he calls traumatic experiences in math because imagine a student who's already struggling and now I'm learning math virtually, right? And so there were some traumatic experiences going on. And even when they're in the classroom, let's face it, math is traumatic for some of our students, right? And so he says, what if we thought about a different way of creating math problems, right? So these verbs set the intention of the lesson. It doesn't mean that each of these words or, or verbs have to be a part of the lesson or the context, but they're the, they set the intention. 
And I'll give you an example. So let me just read them. The love, protest, restore, invest, inspire, create. I mean, we've never thought of math that way. Maybe create, maybe we thought of it that way, right? Uh, one of the things with math, um, with cultural relevance is we want students to know that math is not just what you see in a textbook or do on a piece of paper. We want students to become innovative and create something on their own. How about that? Something new, because all math is not created yet. And we want students to understand that. We want them to co-create. We want them to create some of their own ideas, create their own algorithms, create their own way of thinking. So these are some of the things. So this particular slide is from quite, quite some time ago, right? So this is 2007, so this is not new. In fact, Latson Billings did her work in 1994 and she revisited 20 years later and said, hey, it's still not happening. And so even though we're saying this is what we should be doing, we don't do it because we fall back on the curriculum and on testing. Anyway, protest. So the intention of this uh, lesson uh, was protest. So the teacher and the researcher asked students, what are some issues that you're concerned about? And the students had the poster board and they wrote all of these different issues. Well, the teacher chose the overcrowding of the school because that issue connected with the math content that she wanted to cover, which was area and perimeter, uh, population density as well. But really it was area and perimeter. So she figured, okay, I could use that and still use the context, but still cover the math. And so what happened with this school, it was a school in New York, and it was um, students that, there were two schools in one building. So one school used the first floor and another school used the second floor. And guess what? The students noticed that, the students from the second floor school noticed that the, the school on the first floor was not crowded. The hallways were not as crowded. You know, students see what's fair and not fair. Sometimes it's all about them, but they see what's fair and not fair, right? And so they say, well, that's not fair. I cannot, Angel was her name, I cannot, is her name, I cannot get to the bathroom and back in time because there's no stalls left, it's always crowded, the hallways are crowded. And so they did this um, particular math uh, pro problem. And two things here, one is when the teachers weren't sure what issues that the students would be interested in, guess what, they asked the students, student voice. They literally asked the student, let's see, what are some issues you're um, curious about or that concern you? And then maybe we can connect that to some math that we have to do. And the reason why I love this is that the students actually wrote a letter to the school board and the school board that next fall did not admit new students. And so there was an action involved and they were able to change something. And when students can make a change, they really do get they uh, gain that agency that I talked about, they gain that confidence. Okay, creating from cultural artifacts. So some of you will know about this lady here, uh, Gloria Gilmer, Dr. Uh, Gilmer. Now she wrote, um, she's an ethnomathematician and basically that's just the math of cultures, how people use math in everyday life. And she wrote um, a technical paper using technology to explore the mathematical patterns in African-American hairstyles. And you see there um, her as a youngster uh, graduating. And then you see the one with the hair braids, the cornrows. And she was looking at fractals for that one. And then the next picture you see with the purple and the, the pretty um, hexagons is uh, um, a math subscription box called Black Girl Math Jick. And it's a subscription box by Brittany Rhodes. And she um, highlighted Dr. Gilmer's work. And so she's teaching young girls about, hey, do you like to braid hair? Did you know that there was math or could be math involved in that? On the business side, but not just on the business side. And in fact, Dr. Gilmore did visit salons and learned about what they did with the hair and the business side, but also helped them to see that they were doing something mathematical. In fact, in this particular case, they were generalizing a pattern. And so what you could do, well, they were explaining to her how, how the hair went and how, you know, you start at the back 
and you might have one or two braids and then you go up and you have more and then more and then more and then across the top you have a lot of braids. And so she talked about the math involved in that was generalizing a pattern, basically adding and, and finding the sum of consecutive numbers, in this case from one to 10. Can you do that? Can you find a formula that would make it work all the time? And so around sixth, seventh grade, this would be something that students could do. So that would be more middle ish. And then if you wanted to really talk about like um, either even higher level stuff, you can go to the culturally situated design tools. That's a website. And the name is escaping Ron. What's Ron's last name? Ooh, I can't believe I say his last name. Ron Eglesh. All right. So uh, Ron um, and his colleagues have this website and you can actually use technology and have students program how to do the hair braids. Um, so math is a cultural um, practice. The thing I'll say about this slide is it matters what we value in math, right? And if we only value what's in the textbook, that's what students are gonna call math, right? That's what they're gonna call math. They're, when you ask little children, what is math? They're only gonna tell you what they do on a worksheet, right? But we have to start talking to them to help them to understand what math really is. And it's more than just what you can do on a worksheet. So the last one, creating prompts from social justice issues. So this um, mural is, um, came about around, um, when uh, at the height of Black Lives Matter movement. And this actually is in Connecticut. And it's in, um, I think, Bloomfield, Connecticut. It's, it's beautiful. First of all, it's beautiful. Anytime I see a circle, I think of math, right? And, and so you have all of these high school geometry uh, math topics that you might actually work with with this particular um, Black Lives Matter movement. What, what I think about is just the paint or the chalk you know, how much paint would you need? How much chalk would you need? You know, things like that. Uh, it talks about inscribed, ang inscribed angles and radii and chords, similarity and so forth. If you want this one, okay. Uh, and other um, activities, you can look for the math um, teaching circle. So it's math teaching circle for social justice and these are lessons and resources for teachers, and they're free for you to use. And it, this is high school level, but if you teach a, um, let's say a gen ed math class at the college level, <laughs> you, you can bump it up a bit and this will be right for you. And then the next one as well, it, again, it's for a high school, but you can bump it up, right? And what I like about this is there are many, and actually the last one too, there are many um, different um, authors. So you're getting the perspective of lots of people. Uh, you, and let's check the time. You have topology, uh, fractals, all kinds of math content that you can cover, but you can still cover social justice. This one, um, it, this is funny because I'm on um, X, formerly Twitter, a lot and sometimes Facebook. And so, you know, I have Dr. Walton as one of my friends on uh, Facebook. And she talked about how cool it was when she was looking for information for one of her lectures and how she came across Dr. Floyd Williams. And I say that whether or not it was intentional, she was excited that she was able to highlight this black male who happens to be a mathematician, right? And so I say we should actually be intentional, right? We should be intentional about finding diverse mathematicians that we can use in our lectures, in our math lessons, whether it be K-12 or um, higher ed. So in particular, if you want more information on Dr. Williams and others, uh, you can look at the Mathematically Gifted in Black website. Now, a lot of you probably know about that website, but when I do talks with K-12 teachers, many of them have never heard of it before. So we have to continue to get the word out there. Things that we think are, you know, just a given because we are immersed in it. Sorry, um, Dr. Winger. <laughs> but, but you're saying exactly what I want to say there. And it was like, oh, 
I've found my people in a lot of ways, right? And so it was just all downhill from there. Um, I mean, my PhD is in partial differential equations. You know, that's the area. But right now, I'm doing a lot of social justice mathematics, where I'm just really looking at the world and really trying to figure out how, you know, injustices show up mathematically, right? And so I've been doing a lot of stuff on racial profiling, and I've been doing stuff on just disparities across the board in lots of different areas. And so um, it's a it's an area that doesn't get enough um, focus in the mathematics discipline. Um, so my, my big critique of mathematics right now is that there are too many problems that I think a lot of us could look at and be like, oh, that's just page 37 of this book, right? That's just a specific thing. And yet we, and either we're not looking or we don't care enough to say, wait, we've solved this problem actually. Like the, like the route that one would take, that a food truck would take so that everybody gets fed in a neighborhood, right? That's a graph three problem for days, right? And, and so it's, like, it's that type of stuff that interests me more now than ever. So what I like, <laughs> What I like about Meet a Mathematician and what I like about the joint meetings and, and meeting in these spaces is that we're learning from each other, right? So in 2019, when I wrote uh, the book, uh, Women Who Count, that's, that was my first time ever even attending a joint meetings, right? So I thought, you know, the joint meetings, you know, it's for the mathematicians and I'm a math educator and I don't belong there. And that was so untrue. Not that my colleagues never invited me, but I just didn't feel like it was my thing. And, I, and, 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 and we have to learn to, and this is what Yvonne talked about in her session on making a bridge between math and math ed. We gotta make that bridge a little stronger because you, we, you know, there is this sense of with math educators, you know, maybe we don't belong there. You know, we're math educators, we're not mathematicians. Well, you know, people say, well, yeah, you're a mathematician, but I don't care if you tell me that if I don't believe it. The same thing with students, right? They have to be convinced that they can do the math. They're not convinced just because you tell them that, right? And so we have to think about those things. So I only have about five more minutes because I want to leave space for a question. So I'm going to wrap this up. And there are three ideas that I have about humanizing math, since that was in the title of my talk. One is modifying the curriculum, and I've already talked about that. The other one is developing students' positive math identities. Again, students' identities have to do with how they're positioned in the classroom, how you position them as the teacher, how their classmates position them. We know the, the high status students. We know the students that everyone looks to to raise their hand and answer the question. All of that feeds into students' um, positive math identities. And the last one was, um, oh, positioning students. Oh, the asset base. A lot of times as teachers, we, f we try to figure out where students are going wrong, right? Their so-called misconceptions, right? Because we wanna fill that gap. We wanna help them because we're teachers, we're professors, right? But what we need to do is start from where their strength is. We need to find the assets that they have as well. So Aguere and her um, colleagues, they wrote in um, an NCTM journal, National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, about math identity. And they talk about math identity being st the dispositions that students have about their ability to do math. And when I read that word dispositions, it's all about feeling. Remember, how do kids feel about themselves? If they don't feel confident, then we have to convince them of that. Um, mirrors and windows, that's just a metaphor that we borrow from Rudin Sims Bishop. And it was a literary uh, metaphor, and it talked about how students were reading books, but they weren't seeing themselves reflected in the books. And we believe that's the same thing for math. How can we help students to see themselves reflected in the math context and, and just in uh, the representation that of, of diverse mathematicians? We also, it's okay for us to have windows where students are learning about the broader world, but if that's all we have, then students don't feel like they belong. Uh, two more about positioning classroom. One is uh, Kendall, uh, Kendall Brown and Pam Seder wrote a book on choosing to see, and their book really gives us um, different instructional strategies to help position students as capable in the math classroom. Is it that students um, uh, rely on us to tell them whether they're right or wrong? 
Like no matter what they do, they look at us as the teacher, as the professor, is this right? Like they're never confident that they're right unless we tell them we're right. So who's the authority in the classroom? Uh, Robert Berry, of, um, the past president of NCTM, says these are some questions that we can ask ourselves. We can reflect on these questions to see, are we allowing space for students to take risk? Or is it all about right and wrong answers, right? What, how, like what teaching practices do I have that help students to see that their ideas are valuable? Every student, not just some of the students, but every student. All right, so this is the last slide and we're gonna turn and talk for about a minute. So now do you have any ideas? What are some ideas that you have either that you've already done or that you're thinking about doing now that either bring in diverse mathematicians or bring in some type of cultural relevance, whether it be community knowledge, whether it be just uh, diverse mathematicians, what social justice issues. So turn and talk and give each person in your group about 30 seconds. What are some ideas that you're walking away with? I forgot to ask you to take a picture of me. Sorry. Okay, sure. No, no, up okay, there. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I hope you're walking away with some good ideas about what you could do in your classroom, whatever course you teach. These are some website resources that I've used um, and I've named some of them already. Um, and so go ahead and take a look if you're not familiar with any of these. Um, I feel like most of you will be familiar with them. And Omida already talked about our two distinguished mathematicians. So I'm gonna keep moving on. And then um, now these are also some tools that you could use, um, tools on active learning, and way over in the left side of uh, uh, Rethinking Mathematics. That's a great book and it's an older book, but it has social justice issues in it. And it has um, 
resources like articles, newspaper articles, and you can just update it. So you get the ideas from this particular book and, and, and so forth. And then you have um, the books on the very left side. And, and we talk about social justice issues, and I talked mostly about um, middle and high school, but the, the books on the very left side, uh, Math for Social Justice, those are actually for higher ed. And so you have some resources there, and then of course, Living Proof and Testimonials. I love those two books because students need to read about mathematicians that look like them, and also they need to read about the challenges that these mathematicians had. It's not always about just because you're a mathematician, you know, you do math fast, you love math, you was always good at math. No, not so. Sometimes we don't even know we're good at math until a teacher tells us, hey, you know, you're pretty good at this. Some students don't know that you could use math for a career, right? And so there's all of these things that we need to do. Math is a verb. There's uh, Ron Eglash again power in numbers, and then the, the one with the notes, I like that one, um, Dr. Rachel Schwell from CCSU was one of the editors for that one, I believe she was an editor, and that was about a lot about active learning. So there's lots of information there for us to use, and I'm gonna stop there, and what I wanna stop with is this. So Maya Angelou says, do the best you can till you know better, and then when you know better, do better. So if you learn one thing from today, you should do better at that one thing. You should do better at that one thing. And I actually put all of this into a, um, nope, that's not it, this. Okay, so there's a QR code and there's a Google folder and there's a bunch of stuff in there, the culturally relevant rubric, the, um, this PowerPoint is in there, um, and the revising template is in there, and that's it, thank you. I always plan too much. <laughs> this is a question that you can tweet me. I don't know if it's still called tweet me, but you can tweet me the answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. I ran up here to get to the microphone. Um, that was wonderful. You, you have been so generous with the information that you shared with this audience, um, especially giving us that QR code so we can reference it later. I wanna know if anyone has questions. I'm sure you do. Oh, I see in the back, Dr. Woods. Oh, we do, we have microphones. Um, people can line up if you have a question. So, so I actually think that I'm gonna be a little contrarian a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that I'm in a minority in that I was taught math up until graduate school by people that look like me and came from mm -hmm. similar backgrounds from me. Um, and so when you ask the question about have I, like when I was in elementary school, was I being taught in a culturally relevant way? Uh -huh. I was confident that the answer was yes, but I don't think that any of them were thinking about teaching me culturally relevant. I think that what I had was a trust that mm -hmm. they understood me and I was not an other. I was sure. just like everybody else. And so what that allowed was for them to challenge me and I didn't have to question them or anything like that. And so, um, a long-winded thing to say is that, like, there, that there is a point at math that I actually enjoyed of stripping away all of the stuff that we're comfortable with, right? So, mm -hmm. two plus two is always four, right? Uh, three plus, and you're like, oh, well, let's let's strip that away for a second mm -hmm. and see what you can do with that. And my question is, is the cultural relevance the important thing, or is it the I'm not a other? I, I I think those are are very closely related, right? So I, I started off my story by saying, because I taught in the school, um, in the um, school district where I lived, it, was, it wasn't actually, it was in the town that I lived in because it was a different school district. But because of that, I felt like I knew the students and I felt like I knew sort of their plight, right? And, and so I think instinctively, I think I treated those kids almost like my own, like I want you to do better. Like I, I got out of Bridgeport. And because of that, I did some things that I think you should do. And, and I also, we, we also have to be careful with that because some of the things that I felt looking back at it that I wanted them to do, maybe, it was, maybe that's not for them, but I, I felt like just understanding where they were coming from, I pushed them in a way that 
I don't think not coming from there, some teachers might not know, or some teachers look at the deficits rather than looking at like the brilliance. Like there, if, if you could, um, if you know the words to all of these different songs, let's say rap songs, right? Then I know that you can learn other things too, right? So not thinking of that as a negative, but thinking of it as a, a way, an asset, a strength that I can pull from. And, and so, yeah, I, I don't think that those two things are separate. I don't want you to think that cultural relevance always means the context. So when I talk about positioning students, part of it is how you view students and how you view their ability, their abilities to do math. If you think they can't do it, then you're not being culturally responsive, right? So I, I think that's part of it too. So I don't think that they, these two things are, are, are separate. I think that's part of the pedagogy part, the positioning students. Another question? Uh huh. Thanks for putting up with me and the baby. <laughs> um, and I'm glad that you said this last bit about positioning students. So, so I'm not in education. Uh, I work at a national lab, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that I don't educate, and I'm right. not an educator uh, of sorts. Um, <laughs> I am curious, I guess, it, it may be the positioning statement would, would be the answer, but how do we, uh, who are in industry, start to apply some of these principles, in, in your view, anyway? I, I think um, partnering with schools and some of the programs that you might have in your um, industry uh, bringing students in that might not traditionally be a part of that industry, just opening their eyes to, to different things. Uh, I think um, a lot of the reasons why I was able to continue to move forward in my education was be, because people saw things and they put me in places where I could experience what I would not have experienced in the project that I grew up in, right? And so just seeing those things made me say, well, wait a minute, you know, I could do that too. And so I think having programs where students are, are seeing things outside of their community, we want them to learn about their community, but we also want them to know about, um, you know, other spaces where they do belong. They just don't know it yet because they haven't been exposed to it. So I definitely think making those type of partnerships with schools uh, could be very helpful. And I know a lot of industry does that, yeah. It's a bit of both, right? Mm -hmm. so going back to community and reaching into new spaces, right? Yeah, and yeah. And, and, I, and I, I would say that also for educators, because a lot of times we invite parents in, but we always invite them into our space. You got to come to the after school program, or you got to come to the parent-teacher conference or you gotta come to whatever day we have at the university. I think we need to actually outreach and go to them sometimes so that they're not saying, well, I was never good at math, so you know, I understand why my kid is not good at it. So we need to change that narrative. Some of the slides that you'll see if you go to the um, PowerPoint that I had to skip was a, a perception, a public perception, um, a survey that the Gates Foundation did. And one of the two things they found, one was out of all the subjects in elementary, K-12, excuse me, in K-12, math was the one that most um, adults, adults meaning adults on, over 18, teachers um, and math teachers, so they had three different areas, they all believed that math was the one that was most important. And they believed it not just because of the classroom, but they believed math was important for life after school. But they also said math was the um, subject most in need of um, updating. It's old, right? So math was the subject most in need of updating. And so you'll look at those slides and you can go to uh, Gates' website. It's um, GS. I can't remember, something, group strategy, I can't remember, but it's on, it's on the um, PowerPoint. 
uh, Global Strategy Group, that's what it is. And th those are the people who actually did the survey. And it was a national survey with some focus group in certain areas like Florida, Texas, New York, and California. Right. I'm also gonna be in room 204 and I'll be talking about anything you have questions about. And also I have some stuff in there about the Benjamin Banneker Association, some pencils, some flyers. Um, so I'll be in room 204 after. All right, but Dr. Jones, I have a question. Okay. We still have some time. Um, as I've been incorporating culturally re relevant tasks, mm -hmm. pedagogies in my classroom, uh, sometimes I get a little kickback from my students where they're like, I just want to do the math. Why do I have to apply it? Why do I have to talk about my personal life or yeah. incorporate all of this? How do you deal with students who are resistant? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's true is some, some students, they've gone through 12, 13, 14 years of just doing the math and getting an answer and getting good grades. And now you want to risk my good grades because you want me to actually think about this math. And so, you know, I, I just say keep pushing, keep pushing and, and doing um, the work because what's happening is the, all students, even the one that's giving you pushback, they're learning that math is not just numbers on a, a, on a piece of paper to get answers to, right? They're learning that there's this purpose for math and math is political whether we um, acknowledge that or not. Math is political because it's used, you know, to make different decisions. I've heard a lot about um, some of you that are doing research on redistricting. I mean, that's math all the way. And so math is used for things that affect us. And so whether that student, you know, understands that or not, it, it's true. And so we have to keep pushing and challenging them a little bit to say, hey, it's not just about, you know, getting a grade. It's about thinking mathematically and, and also opening up those spaces for those students that traditionally are left out because when math is only about numbers and math is fast, fast thinking, we're leaving some students out. And so why should that student who's, who's used to probably getting good grades because they can memorize and they, they can call back and those kinds of things, why should that be the only student that the only types of students that uh, you know are in math spaces we want to make sure all students know that they belong mm -hmm. so okay well thank you so much thank you let's thank our speaker